That is another command of Allah to Barakwatala. Say yes and try. Yes, matrimonial as hote na groups. Yes, ayat se liye hue. Wa anke hul ayama minkum. Wa salihina min ibadikum wa imaikum. Try your best to marry, to arrange and facilitate the boys and the girls, the men and the women to marry. Ye cheez hamari community me shayad individual li taur par hai. Lekin community ke taur par hona chahi. As our chairman of Tabligh has mentioned, Kuntum khaira ummatin. Kuntum khaira ummatin means there should be a group of the people, those who are pious, they know the religion, they know the conditions of the marriage, the rules and the regulations of the marriage according to the Sharia, they should act and involve in the community to facilitate the boys and the girls to arrange for their marriage. There should be a group. Now, give matrimonial ka naam de. Quran says, Khaira Umma. Khaira Umma. There should be a group of the people. Say yes and the try. Wa anke wala ayama minkum. Say, now, bachon ki shadi karao. Yaha par to hum shadi karne ke liye tayyar hoate. Bachon ki karane ke liye tayyar nahi hoate. Bete ne kaha, Baba se Baba dekho, us ghar mein ladki achi hai. Aap ja ke pooch lo. Wo mere liye tayyar hai ke nahi hai. Baba gaya. आधे घंटे के बाद वापस आए और बेटे से कहा बेटा मम्मी को सलाम करो गया था बेटे के लिए खुद शादी करके आ गया तो कुरान ये नहीं कह रहा तुम शादी करो कुरान कह रहा हूँ शादी कराओ कुछ बॉयस और गर्ल्स जो मैरिज लाइफ तक पहुंच जाते हैं वी हैव टू फैसिलिटेट देम ख़ुशुसी तौर पर जो लोग बैचुर so, for them, these facilities are very important and necessary. No. Say yes to the marriage and try for that and announce it. When the marriage comes, let's announce it. Send people to the invitation. Let's announce it. That's why in the Hadith, let's announce it. When there is a problem of the marriage, announce it. Let's announce it. Let's announce it. Let's announce it. وَجَعَلُوهُ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ and take it marriage and let it take place in the mosque let people know کس لڑکے کس لڑکی کے ساتھ شادی ہو گئے engagement کو announce کرنے کا کوئی command نہیں ہے دین میں شادی کے announcement کا command ہے شادی announce ہو جائے پھر کوئی دوسرا اس کی طرف نظر بھی نہ اڑا کر دے گی say yes try announce it and participate it اس شادی کے موقع پر جاؤ اٹین کرو خصوصی طور پر میریج میں جہاں ولی میں کی بات ہوتی ہے نا کبھی غیر حاضری نہ ہونے پر جہاں ولی میں وہاں پر مومن بندہ حاضر ہو جانا یہ حدیث میں ہے چلیے say yes to the marriage and try announce it participate it and make it dua at the time of the marriage dua is going to be accepted and say no to Rohbaniyat. Rohbaniyat means staying alone, singlehood. We don't want to get married. Say no to that. Manas, what do you say? Manasticism. Rohbaniyat is not a gift for you. Singlehood is not a gift for you in Islam. Even delaying the marriage is also not allowed. Some of the hadith says certain age is there for the marriage. If the boy and the girl, they reach to the certain age, just arrange for their marriage and facilitate them. Say no to the singlehood, monasticism, and say no to the delaying in the marriage. Delaying in the marriage, according to the hadith of Imam Rida, alayhi salatu wa salam. Imam has mentioned, Inna al-abqara idha adrakna ma tudrekun nisa. فَلَا دَوَاءَ لَهُنَّ إِلَّا الْبَعُولِ When the girls reach to the certain age, we have to arrange and facilitate her for her marriage. There is no any other option except marriage. وَإِلَّا لَمْ يُؤْمَنْ Otherwise, the corruption will enter into the societies. From here, the problem starts. हम प्रॉब्लम्स को कहाँ ढूंढते हैं हदीस प्रॉब्लम कहाँ कह रही है प्रॉब्लम्स फ्रॉम हियर द प्रॉब्लम स्टार्ट्स 
अगर हम उनके लिए सेलेक्ट नहीं करेंगे देन दे विल सेलेक्ट फॉर देम सेल्फ एंड वी विल बी रिग्रेटेड ये मैरिज है ये मैरिज के बेनिफिट्स हैं जैसे मैं नमाज जुम्मा के खुदबे में मैंने बताया the spirit of the marriage the fruit of the marriage is the children with because of this the seminar is organizing be with your child protect your child ye kahan se hum le rahe hain quran iske bare mein kya kehta hai as the brother zain has recited this ayat ya ayyuhal ladina amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara here nar doesn't mean the fire of the hell fire fire everything that brings corruption and the problems in the life of the children is considered as fire sometimes fire this cell phone sometimes fire the thoughts that is coming from the outside maybe sometimes the friend of a child will come fire aag kabhi kabhar nazar aati hai kabhi aag nazar nahi aati hai hum jo aag dekhte hain wo jism jalati hai quran jis aag ke bare mein kehta hai wo dil jala पुरानी मस्जिद में भी बाज आयतों में है क़यामत के दिन आग एक आग है जो बाहर से आती है जो हमारा जिसम जलता है अनदर फैल स्टार्ट फ्रॉम आवर हार्ट नहीं सुरह हुमज आप पढ़िएगा इन शाह आज के शब द फायर स्टार्ट फ्राम आवर हार्ट इन साइड द ह्यूमन बींग कभी फ्रेंड भी हो सकता है एक फायर हो डिटेल आपको आप अच्छी तरह जानते हैं नंबर टू Asking them to stay on the path of Allah Taala. Tell me, how many days have we spent with our children or children? No. Our children are our children. They 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 are our children. जिस दिन अल्लाह भुला दिया जाता है वहां शैतान एंटर होता है मिनल जहां वसवसा वहां आता है जहां पर इंसान अल्लाह से खुद को दूर कर देता है या अपने बच्चों को दूर कर देता है दसीयत दस दिश ऑफ हजरत इब्राहिम अनजरत याकूब टू देर चिल्ड्रन इज फला तमो तुम न तुम मुस्लिमों मरो तुम इस्लाम पर मरो डाई ऑन दी पाथ ऑफ अल्लाह तबारा को ताला डाई ऑन दी स्टेट ऑफ फुल्ली सबमिशन टू अल्लाह तबारा को ताला इट इज़ द सल्यूशन दैट आई एम गोइंग टू प्लेस इन फ्रंट ऑफ ऑल दी पेरेंट्स देखो हमारे बच्चे का दीन कैसा है मुवाहिद है या नहीं है मुसलमान है या नहीं है Sometimes we lost our children because of their deviation, because of their corruption. Not only this, the third point is the seeking the best for them. Hazrat Ibrahim ko Allah ne kaam imam banayenge. Hazrat Ibrahim ne kaha this imamat should go in my generation too, offspring too. What means zuriyati? This is the love of the father towards the children. Nay. मिन जरूरत है इमाम बन जाना कमाल नहीं है इमाम मत शुड ट्रांसफर इन टू द नेक्स्ट जनरेशन फॉर दैट फॉर द इमाम वी आर हैविंग लॉट ऑफ कंडीशन हजरत इब्राहिम द अवेयरनेस ऑफ द इब्राहिम द लव ऑफ द इब्राहिम टूवर्ड्स इज चिल्ड्रन ऑफ स्प्रिंग इज वो मिन जरूरियत है यस टेक केयर ऑफ योर चिल्ड्रन आज दम टू स्टे ऑन द राइट पाथ वी आर गोइंग टू गिव इमाम टू योर चिल्ड्रन टू बच्चे भी अच्छे हों हूँ we have to try our best to make our children successful too best of them rabbana hab lana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata ayun qurrata ayun make them 
the joy of our hearts and our eyes the bachche ko dekhe to khushi ka ehsaas ho bachche ko dekhe to aankhon mein thandak mehsoos ho these are things that can be without training them without the nurturing them on the right path not only that hazrat zakaria asked from allah tbarak wa taala qala rabbi habli min ladunka dhurriyatan tayyiban not only one child or two children but hazrat zakaria is asking how complete zurriya of him should be pure on the right path zurriyatan tayyiban and then we have to include them in our duas ربنا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاه ومن ذريتي دعاء میں کبھی بھی کسی نبی کی دعا میں صرف اپنے لیے نہیں کہا پروردگار مجھے اور میرے بچے میں اور میرے بچے میں پروٹیکٹ کرو اپنے اپ کو میرے بچے بھی پروٹیکٹڈ ہوں مائی لارڈ میک می ان دوز بیلیورز اف مائی ڈیسینڈنٹس کیپ اپ پریئر اور لارڈ ایکسپٹ مائی پریئرز ربنا تقبل دعاء میں بچے کو نماز کے حوالے کروں نماز میرے بچے کو بچا لے گی نماز میرے بچے کو بچا امام خمینی رحمۃ اللہ علیہ نے بڑا خوبصورت جملہ کہا تھا اگر نماز کی طرف بچوں کو نہیں لاؤ گے تو پھر فساد کی طرف دنیا آپ کے بچوں کو لے جائے گی بچہ اگر مسجد کا ہو گیا یا یا میں فاطمیہ چل رہے ہیں سلام اللہ علیہ اگر مجلس کا اور مسجد کا ہو گیا تو آپ نے بچے کو ففٹی پرسینٹ پروٹیکٹ کر لیا ہے اگر نہیں ہو پایا اٹس ویری ڈینجرس میں جو بھی اسٹوڈنٹس جاتے ہیں باہر اسٹڈیز کے لیے ویسٹ جاتے ہیں دوسرے کنٹریز میں جاتے ہیں ان سے یہی کہتا ہوں ہفتے میں ایک دن کسی سینٹر جو ہمارا وہاں پر اسے وزٹ کرو کسی ایک کام کے لیے والنٹری کرو تو دیکھو تمہارا دین تمہارے ہاتھ سے نہیں جائے Yes, not only in this world, we want our children with us in all aspects, in our duas, in our prayers, in positions, in status, the divine status, everything. We want our children with us in paradise too. Wo jannat jannat nahi hai, jin jannat mein bachche humare saath na ho. Wa alladheena amanu wa attava'ahum surriyatahum bi imanin الحقنا بهم ذريتهم in the paradise if we train our children on the right path on the path of the tauhid allah will allow our children our zurriyat to stay with us in paradise to wo jannat jannat nahi jab bacche na ho hamare uske liye mehnat karni padti hai kabhi mehnat kare hum log sometimes we ask allah tbaraka wa taala to help us in this path to protect our children to give us the tawfiq to train them according to the sharia according to the divine command of allah tbaraka wa taala hum kya kehte hain wa aslih li fi zurriyati parwardigar tu mere bachon ka khayal karna it's a beautiful dua after the age of the 40 i think hazrat sulaiman is asking from allah tbaraka wa taala rabbi auzini ان اشکر نعمتک اللتی انعمت علی و علی والدی ان اعمل صالحا ترضا at the age of the 40 when parents reach to that age they come to know the ihsan and the service of their parents jo hamare aagosh mein bachcha aata hai to hame hamare maa baap yaad aate hain bachcha jaga deta hai parents ko sone nahi deta beemar ho jata hai bhook se rota hai bol nahi sakta جو رات بھر سوتا تھا اٹھتا نہیں تھا الارم پر الارم بچتا چلا جاتا اٹھتا نہیں تھا ایک بچے کی آواز پہ اٹھ جائے گا تب اسے پتا چلے گا میں نے میرے ماں باپ کو کتنا ستایا ہوگا جب اس ایج تک پہنچتا ہے اللہ تبار ہوتا اب دعا کرو رب عزین ان اشکر نعمت کلتی انعمت علی و علا والدائی اور اس کے بعد اللہ سے کو پروردگار میرے بچوں کو تو خیال رکھنا ان کو صحیح راستے پر گامزن رکھنا میں نے دعا کی میں نے کوشش کی میری کوششیں تیری عطا کے مقابل میں کچھ نہیں ہے نہیں کام کرو محنت کرو اللہ کے حوالے کرو بچوں کی تربیت کرو تلاش کرو ایٹ دا اینڈ 
submit to the Allah tabaarak wa taala Allah is going to take care of our children inshallah aaj ke zamane mein agar Allah ka saath na ho it's very difficult main details mein nahi ja saka isliye inshallah aap log aate rahiyega sunte rahiyega aapko pata chalega the problems that we are facing in our community is not a joke it's a serious problems अगर आज नहीं जागे गे देन इट्स टू लेट हाथ से चले जाने के बाद वापस लेना मुश्किल है इससे पहले कि दूसरे हमारे बच्चों पर काम करें चलिए हम अपने बच्चों को बचाने की कोशिश करते हैं वाखिर उदावाना अनिलहमदिल्लाबीन वालेकुम वरहि वर्क Dear patient participants, we are ready for a tea break. Couple of points. Um, I'd like to ask the dignitaries to see, stay seated on their seats, and shall I will be served. Um, the question and answer session is going to happen after the second talk. But for you not to forget, I've seen uh, Professor Karim diligently taking notes. I urge you all to do the same. And if you just raise your hand, uh, Asher will come and take your piece of paper, or if you would like, to, uh, or just note it down so that you can remember what you, question you wanted to ask. For now, five minutes. Sounds good. Let's get a tea break. And uh, again, a reminder for the ladies: the washrooms are in the back. For gents, you have to go down uh, to access the washrooms. So five minutes, inshallah, and I uh, hope to see you back here for the next keynote address. Thank you.
<clears throat> okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are almost ready to start. If you could slowly start taking your seats, you can take your tea with you, so we can start. Asam sana. Let's see, who do I know? Hi, Sadiq Baidatu. If you can take your seat. Mr. Jusup. Hi, Basi. Mudassir. Hi, Basi. Take your seats. <clears throat> Hi, Minhal, Hussein Baidatu. Yalla. Seats, please. Musa. Uh, Sayyid Adil, could you join us on the top table, please? It's protocol. <laughs> okay. Brothers and sisters, for our keynote, second keynote speech, all the way from Canada, we have Sister Barack Hussein, an Iraqi Canadian. She's a registered psychotherapist practicing in Ottawa. This year, she completes 15 years of this work. She has a BA in psychology. One second. Um, can the lady side settle down, please? Uh -huh. <clears throat> Ladies, we can hear you all the way here. I'll give you a minute to settle down. Can the volunteers on the ladies' side help me out, please? Can we recite a loud salawat, please? Can you ask the lady volunteers to quiet the back? Okay. <clears throat> so, Sister Bark is also known as the Muslim Counselor. And she's a passionate public speaker in Muslim mental health, social justice, and also does poetry. She has worked locally, locally is in Canada, I guess, and internationally in Iraq and uh, associated with Ayatollah uh, Sistani's office. Um, a number of documentaries, with, uh, she's uh, worked with Muslim Vibe and Safir TV and Imam Hussein TV. So she brings a lot to the table and she's a guest here. So it's not like we haven't said the deal. If you miss a point that you can get back to him. We only have her for a limited time. So I urge you, make the most of it. Take notes, ask questions and let's make the most of it, right? So can you please recite another salawat to welcome her to the podium. Salawat. Just for two minutes. What can you do in two minutes? I think. <clears throat> at least, at least I'm a gents, I go there discipline. Uh, say the deal. My daughter is also saying that I'm going to see a girl now. So kya ho? Aisa bhi kuch nahi hoga mere saath. Mr. Brand, I think we're ready for you. Allow salawat again, please.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا محمد وعلى آل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In his name I begin with the best of blessings on the noblest of prophets and the Lord and beloved of our hearts Muhammad and his holy progeny Salawat Respected scholars, elders, sisters and brothers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, peace be upon you all. Before we begin, I'd like to dedicate this talk to the children of Palestine, who at this point are only under the protection of their Lord and the angels. I dedicate this talk to the ones, victims, who are now survivors of abuse, specifically of sexual abuse. And finally, I dedicate this talk to all of those suffering in silence. You are not alone. This talk tonight is for you, inshallah. Your voice is being heard in the name of Lady Fatima, alayha salam. Bismillah. Wa salawatu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. I commend this community in taking the initiative to creating the safe space to learn and explore this much needed seminar in order for us, all of us here, to heal and protect our children and youth from abuse that they may have experienced or they may in the future. It is much overdue that we explore taboo and often hidden and hushed topics within the mental health realm that we started years ago at a deeper level in order to tackle the root problems of many of our community's psychosocial religious challenges that have plagued our, our growth for years from reaching our full potential in being meaning contributors to our society and in being prepared physically, socially, spiritually, and mentally for the Imam of our time. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now with that in mind, will be delving into very sensitive and explicit detailed content and information at times that could be potentially triggering for our audience tonight. And so with this trigger warning, if anybody is impacted by what is presented and may need a moment, please do feel free to leave the room, you know, for a little bit for a breather and gather yourself. And if anybody does need to talk to a, talk to a professional, please do reach out to the local therapist you have here or you can use Nasiha phone line for free for counseling supports. Now, if you do leave the room and are okay, just give a thumbs up or okay. Otherwise, maybe a volunteer may come after you. I may leave here and come after you to check on you if you're okay. And Joe, just remember that this trigger response is a normal response, right? Because some of the content tonight could evoke that or even this entire weekend. And so it would be valuable and helpful to get the supports that you may need in your healing journey that may have impacted you or perhaps your children. Our psychological and religious development have vital roles in helping us to understand the world around us. A learned or adopted worldview from childhood until young adulthood and beyond provides a blueprint for that person to navigate who and what they will become in their lives. This leads us to the discussion on understanding the psychology of sexual abuse, molestation in children, and young adult development, and how it impacts their lives. So in order to explore the psychology of child and young adult development with a cross analysis of psychological and Islamic theory and practice and development, we first need to understand this previous idea and why the seminar is needed from a psychological and practical perspective as our respected scholar has made clear from a religious perspective before me. So the Kratz analysis will be presented later on, inshallah, in the next days, and we'll update you when and where that lecture will be, inshallah. So before we begin the next two days of presentations, workshops, panel discussions, let's first understand for the next 35 minutes of this evening, first and foremost, number one, what is child sexual abuse and molestation? along with what is assault, harassment, and grooming. Number two, the long-term psychological effects of sexual abuse. 
the behavioral effects of sexual abuse, interpersonal, number five, the physical, and number six, the community and societal effects of sexual abuse, and why such a seminar is so needed from a psychological perspective. So number one, what is child sexual abuse and molestation? Experiencing childhood sexual abuse or molestation is considered an adverse childhood experience, or ACE, A-C-E, where it is a traumatizing event that can go on to negatively impact nearly every aspect of a child or human's well-being. We know that childhood sexual abuse is a complicated issue. It can happen in many different ways, and a victim's reactions are very individual. So child sexual abuse or molestation defined by the National Clearinghouse on Family Violence of Health Canada occurs when a child under 18 involved in sexual activity that they don't understand or cannot consent to is used for sexual purposes by an adult or an adolescent. It involves exposing a child to any sexual activity or behavior. This abuse most often involves touching or inviting a child to be touched. Other forms of this type of abuse also includes juvenile prostitution, exploitation through child pornography. It is inherently emotionally abusive and it is often accompanied by other forms of mistreatment where it can be physical or non-physical. It is a betrayal of trust and an abuse of power over the child. Now legally, any child under the age of consent is a victim of this type of abuse where they are involved in any type of this activity. So child sexual abuse can be physical or non-physical. Common examples include, and I know like we mentioned earlier at the very, very beginning, we might be hearing things that are uncomfortable, we're not used to hearing, but that's the point of such a seminar, right? So we learn about this so that we can protect. So, rape or attempted rape, fondling inappropriate touching, being asked to expose or watch another person expose, being photographed or recorded and being shown pornographic materials, for example. A few more distinctions I'd like to clarify for definition purposes is that sexual assault is defined as unwanted sexual activity, for example, touching, kissing someone without consent, rape. Sexual harassment is behavior characterized by the making of unwelcome or inappropriate sexual remarks or physical advances in a workplace or other professional or social situation as the Oxford Dictionary describes. Child molestation is commonly used to refer to younger children under the age of 12. So they're not interchangeable. Under 18 is sexual, child sexual um, abuse, and molestation is for under 12. So this is the crime of engaging in sexual acts with minors, including the touching of private parts, exposure, taking pornographic pictures, rape, inducement of sexual acts with the molester or with other children. The word sexual assault, this term, refers to sexual contact or behavior that occurs without explicit consent from the victim. Some forms of this assault includes attempted rape, fondling or unwanted touching, forcing a victim to perform such acts. Sexual assault in the context of this seminar is in reference to a pattern of sexual abuse to a child that happens over a period of time. Now, potential short-term effects of child sexual abuse could include, and these are things to watch for your children, or things that perhaps you've noticed in the past. Increased illness, body aches, or other physical complaints. Poor attendance or performance at school. Difficulty concentrating or memory loss. Mood changes, regressive behaviors. Sleeping and eating disorders. Lack of self-esteem, nightmares, self-harm, or suicidal thoughts self-hatred or reduced self-esteem, disinhibited behavior, zoning out or not listening, focusing, and Michelle will get into the long-term effects shortly. One more concept we should become familiar with is the word grooming. It is the manipulative nature that many sexual offenders use to get close to their victims can cause through ongoing thought distortions, self-identity issues, uh, uh, relational harm and isolation with the child. So grooming describes the preparatory stage leading up to child sexual abuse and exploitation after undertaken to do what? To gain the trust, 
and or the compliance of the child or the young person and to establish secrecy and silence to avoid disclosure. So a child or a young person's parents, caretakers or other significant adults, including organizations, may also be groomed by somebody intending to harm the child. Grooming may occur in person as well as online, especially in this digital age. This includes a range of behaviors and or written or verbal communication. Can we have a loud salawat? So it can be like we said, verbal or written, with the child or young person or with significant adults with the intention of facilitating sexual contact with the child or young person and preventing disclosure, key thing, the prevention here. Online grooming can take place through phones or in interactive platforms including chat and instant messaging. It could be on apps, social media, which is the most common in gaming, right, gaming. Perpetrators use interactive platforms as a gateway to initiate this contact with the child, which is why we're always saying, make sure you know what's on your child's devices, make sure what they have access to, parental control, because this is how it can happen. Right underneath your nose, your child could have their tablet or their phone, and somebody's actually grooming them through that process of secrecy. So grooming may cause a child, and watch out for these, think as though they have an important and special relationship with the person who is harming them. They can experience confusion over the nature of their relationship. Internalize the abuse as their fault. And feeling responsibility for any harm experienced and fearing, fearing that they may be blamed, punished, or not believed. Fear that they will be separated from their family or home if they speak out and or believe that disclosure will cause harm to someone or something they love and care for, such as members or pets. Finally, for grooming, this includes a range of behaviors, like we said, written or verbal communication with the child or young person, or with significant adults with the intention of facilitating that sexual contact with the child or young person and preventing disclosure. This online grooming can take place through phones, interactive platforms, like we said, and this is a way to initiate that. So, are we clear on some of these definitions? I know some of them might seem a bit blurry, but I think we have an idea now with age and what they could entail and so on and so forth. So now let's get into the long-term effects. So number two, the long-term psychological effects of this type of abuse undoubtedly will negatively impact nearly every aspect of a person's well-being. Child sexual abuse, so under 18, and molestation under 12, according to our definitions, are linked to a range of serious mental health issues, which can begin shortly after the abuse, uh, the, rather the abuse occurs, but may not appear necessarily until years later. Delayed mental health issues related to these abuses may be due to the fact that child, in childhood, a victim may not fully understand what is happening. And I can personally attest to this, to the work that I do, where I have young adults at the university come and say, this and this happened to me when I was young, but I didn't know it was wrong. Or the Muslim students will say, I didn't even know it was haram because of the relationship with that older person. Later, they realize that it was inappropriate and in fact haram, right? Now, children under the age of 12, in particular, it might be confusing for them, right? When abuse is not painful, because when we think of abuse, we think physical, right? But this type may not be painful, and it may not be until adulthood that the victim fully realizes what has occurred. Studies increasingly show that adult survivors often do not recall childhood sexual abuse until they are asked about it. Whether a victim immediately recognizes the experience that are abuse or does not realize it until adulthood, they are at risk. This is the key thing, whether they realize or not, they are at risk at developing similar mental health concerns. So let's take a look at these and you can jot these down here if you like. I feel like I'm giving a lecture at the university right now. So let's take a look at them. PTSD, who can tell me what that is? PTSD? Post-traumatic stress disorder, depression and anxiety. Are you familiar with these terms? Have you come across them? 
Let's do a quick review. So PTSD is one of the most common psychological effects of childhood sexual abuse. I see at least one or two a week with the students that come see me. Studies show that PTSD related to this type of abuse is more likely to manifest in adulthood. It can manifest differently in different individuals. Common signs include, if you want to write these down, reliving the event through flashbacks or memories, avoidance of intimacy or sexual relations with their partner, emotional effects like numbness, fear, or shame, loss of memory of the event, hyperarousal, so easily started, so jumping, right? Difficulty with sleep and concentration. We know that PTSD is a complex psychological condition that can increase the likelihood of other issues such as depression, anxiety, substance use, as well as suicide. So the other effect is depression, where studies routinely confirm that there's a significant correlation between childhood sexual abuse and adult depression. Depression can have an overwhelming impact on the quality of life and can last for short periods or years. Depression manifests in many ways. Who can tell me a few that you're familiar with? With depression, symptoms of depression. Shout it out, yes. Isolation from society, absolutely, bless you, thank you. Who else? From the lady side too. Isolation, feelings of sadness, emptiness, right? Anger or irritability, loss of interest in activities that you once enjoyed, perhaps coming to the mosque, sports, school, work, right? Sleep disturbances like insomnia, oversleeping, undersleeping, lack of energy, loss of appetite or an increase in appetite. Everybody responds to stress differently, right? Overeating, weight gain, feelings of shame, worklessness, low self-esteem, cognitive difficulties. So thinking, memory recall becomes very challenging when you're dealing with symptoms of depression. Suicidal ideation or even attempts. Loss of interest in engagement or faith-based activities like we said. Prayer, fasting, attending mosque, taking off the hijab, going to ziyara. And without opening a can of worms, a quick example comes to mind are the convert sisters who convert to Islam. I know this firsthand dealing with some of these cases. Only to be abused and used, which results in them eventually leaving the faith. This is like the drastic opposite end of what happens. They leave the faith due to the discrepancy in what they learn about Islam and how they are treated within the society, within the Muslim community. So depression and suicidality are the top symptoms. I'm telling you straight up from being on the phone trying to get a sister out from the darkness to safety to light. Another example is the recent sexual molestation and abuse allegations from within our own communities that we have all become aware of in the last few months that have always been there and not been addressed. I remember earlier I heard one of the speakers mentioning that before the digital age was here, these things did not exist. With all due respect, they have always existed. Always existed. We just didn't know about it, we didn't see it, and social media is bringing it out, that's for sure. Depression, to say the least, is a very serious mental health condition. If we leave it untreated, it can lead the child sexual abuse victims to what? What is the worst outcome of depression we said? Suicide. For anxiety, survivors of childhood sexual abuse are also at risk of developing anxiety disorders, both in childhood and in adulthood. Anxiety disorders can manifest in many ways, just like we saw with depression. One can broadly identify anxiety as feelings of apprehension that have serious effects on thoughts, on our actions and emotions, and the quality of our life. So common signs of anxiety, who can tell me a few, perhaps, that you've come across, that you've seen, not necessarily you if you're sharing it. I can tell you very openly that I learned early on in high school that my stress response is anxiety. I was sitting in an algebra class one day and all of a sudden my hands were sweaty, shaky, and then my breathing became very intense and I passed out. The next thing you know, I was taking on a stretcher to the children's hospital. I was uh, 16 at the time. 
And then I was sent from one doctor to the next with my father, to a neurologist, a hemoglobin specialist, a this specialist, a that specialist. Finally, we walked into a Dr. Khan, cardiologist. He took one look at my father and he said, back off, Baba, you're putting too much pressure on her. She just has stress, and that is a stress response. Since then, till now, I had to study my body and my stress response to learn how to reverse the effects of what happens if I don't eat healthy, if I don't sleep well, and if I don't exercise, I feel electricity running up and down my legs. That is stress hormones, cortisol. And if I don't take care of it, I may have an anxiety attack like I did back in that class. I had to reschedule everything in my courses instead of speeding school because my dad wanted me to be a doctor. So I had to graduate quickly, get A plus, get into medical school because it's a different system than this part of the world. My body wouldn't handle that. Slow down. I eventually found my way to psychology instead of psychiatry. But if I didn't learn about anxiety, I don't think I would have made it to what I'm doing today. So it's really important to understand how your body responds to stress. Don't let it get to disorders. So some signs of anxiety, feeling panic or in danger, nervousness or restlessness. I think a lot of us feel that, right? Increased heart rate or breathing. Overwhelming worry, wiswas, we say in Arabic sometimes, right? Sleep and cognitive issues. So severe anxiety requires medical intervention as well as therapeutic intervention. So if treatment is not received, what happens? The condition can worsen. I can attest to it. I've seen it with my own patients. In addition, the state of anxiety hinders one from seeing the situation clearly due to cognitive dissonance or distortion, or deception. So we'll describe this a little bit more later on in specific examples. So don't forget this point. We'll come back to it later. Number three, long-term behavioral effects. And these are closely related to the psychological effects. So in many cases, behavioral effects appear as coping mechanisms to help victims deal with co-occurring mental and emotional issues. So they can be seen, who can take a guess? behavioral, that seem like we're coping with our psychological, who can tell me what those could look like? It's boring, but it's only me talking. I like interaction. Who has an idea? What would be behavioral that looks like it's coping, but it's actually causing more harm? Any ideas? What was that? Outbursts of anger, okay. How is that coping, though? By the way, I forgot to bring it up here with me, okay? But whoever answers later will get a gift from Ziada. I have Ziada gifts with me. So whoever answers, I'll give that. I forgot to bring it with me. Oh, there we go. Now we have more answers. What was it? No, Fullness. No. What was that? What is it? Mindfulness. M mindfulness. But that is a positive coping strategy. Negative coping strategies. Okay, let me give you one example. Maybe it'll help you with another. Yes, uncle. Okay, so these, these behaviors occur. I'm thinking more deeper, such as substance abuse. Huh? Drinking alcohol. What was that? Drinking alcohol. Thank you. That's exactly, I'm saying it right now. Substance abuse. Absolutely. So we all know. We all know that substances are prohibited, whether it's drugs or alcohol, in our faith, right? However, their reach is more accessible when one is struggling with their mental health. The lines are blurred. This will make me feel better. I can perhaps do this better or that better, right? What we see in studies is that they show that they are consistently find a high correlation between childhood sexual abuse and dependence on drugs and alcohol. One study conducted on adults and an inpatient substance abuse detox center found that 81% of women and 69% of men reported physical childhood sexual abuse. That's high. There's also a, co a known correlation between this type of abuse and the alcohol abuse later in life. This is a particularly complex topic as it's believed that family alcohol abuse is likely a contributing factor in the sexual abuse of the child. This suggests that a family history of alcoholism can contribute to both sexual abuse and the likelihood of a victim going on to abuse alcohol. 
So it gets pretty complicated. Substance abuse comes with pervasive effects on every area of life and can lead to serious negative consequences for psychological and physical health. It also negatively impacts what? Our relationships, our education, our earning ability, our work. Another one we see here is eating disorders. Okay? We see these disorders in the Muslim community more apparent during the holy month of Ramadan. That's when we see it more. Usually throughout the year, they're not really that noticeable. What we have seen in studies is that there's a strong correlation between childhood sexual abuse and the development of eating disorders. Eating disorders can take several forms, including, and I'm sure you've heard this. If not, take note. This is important. Anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, rumination disorder, avoidant or restrictive food intake disorder. One view, why we talked about how these look like coping mechanisms, one view is that eating disorders can be a dysfunctional coping mechanism that allows victims to establish what? Who can tell me? A sense of ahsantum, control over the body. Eating disorders are highly dangerous and can lead to malnutrition and a host of other physical conditions and eventually death if not treated. Number four, long-term interpersonal effects of sexual abuse show themselves in sexual risk behavior. Victims of these abuses are more likely to engage in these risky behaviors. What are these behaviors linked to? They're linked to sexual abuse in childhood and accompanied by many negative consequences, including higher likelihood of further sexual abuse, teenage pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases, and HIV. These types of behaviors can take many forms. Some of the most common involve unprotected, multiple partners, and sexual activity at an early age. So this is something we know that is happening within our communities. We don't talk about it publicly, but what is it known through? Temporary marriage, AKA muta, right? Yet we do not talk openly about it and their negative effects. We can see here how severe the effects can be, not to mention the psychosocial impact on the family and the community when it becomes known especially in the cases of infidelity. Halal, haram, we're not discussing that here. That's a whole other lecture for the scholars. But we're talking about the psychosocial impact, what it does to the family unit. Number five, we're getting to the end. I should slow down, I'm speaking fast. Number five, the long-term physical effects of sexual abuse. This can range from painless to traumatizingly painful. Oftentimes, victim may experience immediate injury. I can attest to that. When people come into my office and they describe what has happened to them, it is an absolute nightmare. And inshallah, you never have to experience it or your loved ones. But we see STIs, pregnancies, and so on and so forth. However, childhood sexual abuse is also linked to many long-term consequences for physical health. Data shows that adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse at a higher risk of developing. Look how interesting this is. It doesn't mean you have this because you may have been abused in the past. However, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, STIs, and teen pregnancy. In addition to these direct physical consequences, of course, the psychological, emotional, behavior effects contribute to poor physical health and associated conditions. So let's look at the correlations here with everything we've just discussed so far. Depression and anxiety we know can lead to suicide, suicide attempts, and self-injury. Sexual risk behavior can lead to increased rates of STIs, HIV, pregnancy, and yes, even abortion. Substance abuse pose a high risk to physical health in many ways, including a risk of lung disease, heart disease, liver disease, kidney failure, stroke, cancer, dental problems, nerve damage, HIV, hepatitis C, heart infections, skin infections. 
Eating disorders lead to a wide range of serious physical health conditions, including starvation, malnutrition, cardiovascular problems, gastrointestinal issues, neurological issues, as well as hormonal imbalance. The physical effects of these abuses are highly complex, which are closely tied to the psychological and behavioral health of the victim. Psychological symptoms can manifest as, like we said earlier, coping mechanisms for dealing with the unresolved trauma of these childhood abuses. It is important to keep in mind here, the level of support, and please hear me, my dear community, the level of support a survivor receives can have a direct influence on long-term outcomes. One survivor might get counseling early and go on to experience a positive mental, emotional, and physical health. Another victim may never receive treatment and go on to experience any combination of the many possible effects presented and discussed. With a combination of medical intervention, therapy, medication, family, community, and faith, I always include faith in treatment because there is a high correlation, significant correlation between faith and our well-being. This survivor can find relief from the harsh consequences of childhood sexual abuse. One can also take this further to say that bringing the perpetrators to justice will also provide relief and the ability to move on in their lives as they finally get the validation and acknowledgement that they can help and get in their healing journey. Finally, number six, and the community societal effects. Can we have a loud salawat? In light of what the child is experiencing and observing while they are exposed to the traumatic incident, a very important issue arises here, is how the child fell for it to begin with. Do you remember earlier what we talked about? Do you remember the terms I mentioned? Who can tell me? Starts with a G. I sent him. I hear the sisters louder. Ladies, if you'd like, use the mics. Apparently, the brothers are asking. But I heard you. I'm good. All right. Grooming. Right? The cognitive dissonance. The use of trust. Misuse, rather, of trust. Right? So we've come back to this point here. So meaning the deception of either a person or a situation that may have been innocently assumed to be safe. The point of cognitive dissonance or distortion or deception here that we spoke about earlier is important in terms of how this typically falls into these two institutions, the family or the religious. Statistics show that 91% of these incidences are from the people the child is familiar with. Allahu Akbar. And close to such as family members, community members, as well as trusted religious figures. Trusted figures use their roles and positions to exert their power and abuse it to sexually assault, abuse, molest, harass, all of the definitions that we spoke about earlier. The child or the youth, and another topic, not for this conference, but vulnerable women, whether they're widows or divorcees in our community, right? So just like we defined at the beginning, all in the name of their position. And to clarify, I did not say all religious figures. I said some, to be clear. The child or the youth become confused because they trusted this person. They went along with it. And for the most part, but later became aware that there was something off about that incident, that situation. Does this sound familiar? Yes, it should. Because as we know, this has been the case where? In the Catholic Church, as well as in the Jewish communities, and sadly, our own communities and societies have not been exempt from it at all. Examples of such that can be seen in our own religious communities range from masjid volunteers, teachers, trusted religious figures, like we said before, and Ziyada group leaders. What are the short-term and long-term effects of these violations towards the child or the youth? All of what we have discussed already 
And in addition to the dissociation from these community figures and their trust in the world is shaken to the point where they could, and I have witnessed, where they leave the faith. For how can somebody who is supposed to be representing our religion behave in such a monstrous and absolutely vile manner that goes against the very essence of what our beloved prophet and the Emma stood for and taught? What then can be done in light of everything that we have explored this evening? What did we look at? Number one, the definitions, right? The long-term psychological, behavioral, interpersonal, physical, and societal effects of childhood sexual abuse. So I leave you with these questions to ponder throughout this weekend. And when you, in inshallah, attend all of the presentations and the workshops, think about these questions. What can we do to prevent and protect our children? How do we support the victims and the survivors? I'll reword that. How do we support the victims to become survivors? There's a difference. You could be once a victim, now a survivor. What is to be done to the perpetrators as well as those who are aware and hide the crimes which make them complicit against humanity? How do we deal with the abuse of the position and hypocrisy? Munafaka, the hypocrisy of power in our communities. What would you do if this was your own child? And finally, would you keep quiet or would you do everything in your power to protect them and seek justified justice using justified anger, which is taught in our faith from the perpetrators? Because we all, as a community, and especially as Muslims, and the Muslims of the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, have a moral, psychological, societal, religious obligation to protect and nurture the next generation to fulfill and reach their full potential to serve whom? To serve the Imam of our time. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Give me a mic. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sister Rock. Asana Sana. A fair trigger warning was given and delivered. Um, I want to make the most of it. Some claims have been made. And I would like to ask Professor Kareem to join us on the panel here. Just to get some local context, please. <clears throat> Can you please recite a big salawat? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Okay. Um, I'm going to regulate the questions like this. If you have a question, raise your hand. The usher will bring your mic. If you don't want to say it, write it down. The usher will bring the paper to us. So I'll go first. Uh, first question with the gents, then the ladies, then I'll uh, read out a written question. If um, if you want to specify uh, that you want this particular scholar to answer, please do so. For the scholars, um, please keep your reply to three minutes, no more. Okay? And we will order. Okay. So if, if the question comes to one scholar too much, then I will alternate it. No, it's good. Um, okay. Question time, please. Uh, yes, we have a question there, Usher. Can you please uh, take the mic to Irfan? Back, please. Uh, Mr. Captain's got the mic. It is not meant to be, Captain, sir. Can we have another mic, please? In the meantime, if the ladies have a question, then I'll take that one first while we're getting the mic 
we're fixed here. So somebody from the lady side, please. Okay. Can you turn off the mic? Yeah. Yes. I have three questions. <clears throat> the first question is, if marriage is really such a nice and good step, then why are there abusive marriages that exist within our community? And when I speak of abusive marriages, I mean mental, emotional, and physical abuse. My second question is, if a couple is in an abusive marriage, and they have children in that marriage, is it not better for the couple to opt for a divorce rather than staying, abusing each other in the toxicity and traumatizing the child or children? The final question is, Sheikh Adil said that when there is marriage, there is baraka. If there, if marriage really does bring baraka, then why do we often find couples fighting due to finances, arguing due to finances, and why is there poverty in, during marriage, especially with couples? You'd find a lot of couples struggle with poverty. That's all. Thank you very much, sister. I'll give the mic to say the deal. So let me repeat the question. Um, question one was, what was question one? I can remember it's two and three. If there's, marriage is merciful, then why is it abuse? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is principle or the real uh, face of the marriage. If it is a command of Allah Taala that there is a baraka in marriage and rahmat is in marriage, that obviously there is a baraka in the rahma. Normally, uh, the baraka will go away or we go away from the mercy of Allah Taala, because we are not aligned with the command of Allah Taala after marriage. Maybe sometimes our expectations are um, in a higher level than the marriage itself. Expectations from each other. जब तवाको बढ़ जाती है ना, expectations बढ़ जाते हैं, तो we feel that marriage is troubling us, but marriage is not troubling us. Our expectations are troubling us to weaken the concept of the marriage. Marriage may problem nahi hai. Problem hamari understanding mein hai. How we'll take the marriage is very much important. Jab ek aadmi tha, to uske risk ka intizam Allah kar raha tha. Jab do ho gaye, to risk badna chahi. If they become two, that means the risk has to be increases by supporting each other. By planning each other, two minds comes together, that means increase is there. Normally, if, if there is no divine command, but according to the worldly planning, if two minds stay together in a one place, there will be the increase is there. But we are not together after marriage because we are having our own uh, problems that we are connecting to the marriage. Kabhi tawakko expectations badh jati hain. Uh, worldly expectations, kabhi kabar, the, the goal of the marriage is not aligned with the divine, divinity or the command of Allah Tawarak wa Ta'ala. Kabhi kabar, hum marriage ko ek institution nahi samasthe, marriage ko zariya samasthe hain to fill, fulfill our desires. Agar marriage ko desires se connect karenge, to after some time we will feel that this marriage life is boring. The problems start from uh, our understanding related to the principle of the marriage. If we take it as a divine command of Allah and stay with the, uh, with the trust on Allah Taala, definitely marriage will help them to gain the barakah and to increase the uh, sustenance too. Ye to experience bhi aisa hai. We have seen some examples of the marriage problems. The majority of the people, those who are 
uh, not good enough in their uh, business or in their job after marriage, they will well settle. A majority of examples, are the examples are the good examples. Jitne hamare paas scholars hain, jitne hamare paas wealthy people hain, rich people are before marriage, no one knows them. But after marriage, they come to know that yeah, they are the personalities in our community. The marriage, the provision has been increases. And the wealth has been increases and the baraka also increases. So, we have to remove two things in our One, expectations. Or though we can't, don't relate the marriage to the material life, maybe baraka is there. Along with the poverty, Allah will provide them in the future a better way of life for them, inshallah. Thank you very much, Sayyid. Ah, yeah. Changamoto. Um, just Please, briefly, add to this. bottom line, we are fallible. Men, women are fallible, right? We're going to do our best to try and fulfill what Allah has taught us in marriage. The reality is some people are selfish. They're not going to follow. They're not going to do their best. All of the things we discussed earlier, right, culture, family, influence, can make people feel, well, you know, I'm the man. I do what I want. You know, I was abused as a child, so I'm going to do what I want over my husband. Look, all these kind of mentalities come into place here. I always like to add the part about what are your intentions coming into this marriage? Both of you, are you truly coming together to better yourself, going towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So you're going to truly do your best to fulfill half your religion as we are taught? Or are you there to gain for yourself only? So what are your intentions in the end when it comes to this marriage? You can have a beautiful marriage or you can have a terribly abusive marriage. Depends on the intent of what you're putting into this marriage. So if you keep that in mind, and I hope it helps the sister who, uh, who brought in that question because I think it's a very valuable question. The reality is we hope to have a marriage like Imam Ali and Sayyidah Fatima alayhum salam They are role models for that of the Prophet and his wife Khadija, peace be upon them, right? The reality is we're fallible. We're going to make mistakes. Our nafs in this dunya teaches us to do this or go that, right? Always put the intentions in front together. What is your intent in this marriage? Are you truly trying to complete half of your religion? How are you going to do that? And psychologically, come to the healthy communication <laughs> workshop. We're going to talk about that later, inshallah. Asantam, Sister Barak. Uh, to the questioner, I'm just going to go with the first question. They're coming thick and fast. Uh, Captain... Has the mic, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. I have uh, seen you address uh, uh, abuse in the context of uh, sexual and physical abuse largely. Would you consider uh, pressure from parents to perform academically uh, to a child or to pursue a certain career as abuse? And if so, where do you draw the line between abuse and discipline? Uh, secondly, this is addressed to both of you. Uh, do you believe that pursuing religious obligations and ethics in a proper context would avoid a larger part of the dilemma? In other words, avoiding going the secular route? Because abuse is... Uh, largely uh, coming from uh, cultural practices and uh, general societal pressure. But religious ethics normally prohibit and forbid uh, being abusive in any kind of way. Thank you. Sister Brack, you'll take that one? Yes, please. The first one. Uh, repeat the question. Would you like the question to be repeated? Just the first one. The first one. So everyone can remember as well. Um, Captain, the first one was that uh, pressuring the children to study. Where's, where do you draw the line? What's discipline and what is uh, a legitimate pressure? They need to be uh, forced to do some of the work. So I'm going to answer this question not the way you expected. There's a third part. Okay, let's answer the first. So may, may I phrase it uh, correctly? Okay. What I was asking was, do you consider... What, would you consider pressure from parents or teachers to perform academically or in sports as abuse. Secondly, to pursue a career, a particular career, maybe a parent wants a child to be an engineer, a doctor. Do you consider that as abuse? 
And second, uh, the second part of the question was, where do you draw the line between abuse and discipline? In which case, you want the child to perform well in school, but where do you draw the line between uh, uh, abuse, abuse and, discipline? and discipline? Great questions, because I do believe our communities, and I grew up like that too, had to be a doctor. I ended up being a doctor anyways. Each time I go to Iraq, they call me Dr. Barak, because anybody with a master's there, it's considered a doctor. So I ended up being a doctor anyways. The idea, let me answer this question, uncle, this manner, okay? If your child or your young adult child has skills and abilities other in what you want them to be, wouldn't you want to nurture that? And rather than trying to push and pressure them to do something what society expects them to do. Meaning, if they have incredible artistic skills, are you still going to force them to be an engineer when they're incredibly talented in the arts? They can pursue the arts and still do it as a service and khidmah in the name of Ahlul Bayt alayhum as -salam. You can still make a meaningful career because I guarantee you, and I'm telling you, especially working with young adults in university, most of the cultural Desi kids that I get and Arab kids and African kids and Caribbean kids, all the ethnic kids, most of them are pressured into engineering or medicine, nothing in between. Rarely will I get the teacher or the lawyers. It's these two ex uh, ends of expectations of society. Why? Because our society says there's prestige in these positions, right? It's like, wow, my son or daughter is this. But really, is it about you, mom or dad? Or is it about your child's abilities, their talents, what you nurture in them, right? I was supposed to go to medicine, but my brain can't handle Physics, algebra, chemistry. My dad, mashallah, has a PhD in physics. I'm the eldest. Imagine the pressure. Huh? How I answer this question is this, again. Nurture your child's skills, abilities, and interests. That doesn't fall into haram, of course. That they can still serve the Ahlul Bayt in some way or another with their talent. Is it abuse? How are you doing it? Are you beating them? Are you verbally demoralizing them? Are you threatening them? Are you putting them down? Yes, that's abuse. That's abuse. If you're constantly comparing your child to their cousins or the next door kid or that child in the Imam Barga or this, this, this and that, that's abuse. That's verbal. That's not okay. That's not the teachings of our adab and akhlaq of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Wouldn't you agree? Nurture the skills of your child. Make them love what they're doing that you can still service the Ahlul Bayt with them. What was the second part of that first question? Did I answer it? I think this is enough. Uh, we have to go through other like questions, that. Captain. I'm going to stop you right there. But uh, yeah, the, my, my desiness is, uh, is can't, be, can't take this, man. Quite traditional uncle can say, you know, the Jamaican guy says, he beats the kid and he said, pop. He said, Dad, why did you beat me? He says, just in case. You know, that's the school we come from, man. So, anyways, um, I'll go to the written question. Um, say the deal. The question is that we're encouraging people to get married. Can we not now start organizing events in our Jamaat where spouses can meet? Sitting on that chair is not an easy task. Isliye mola ekanat ne kaha jis kursi par tum baithte ho, kursi tumari nahi hai. Ye jhooti kursi hai, basi kursi. Before you, some other people already sat on the chair. Yes, uh, there are some uh, plannings are going on uh, in various communities. So how can we? Uh, facilitate the adults to know each other and uh, to move forward. Uh, Sheikh Nuru has given one uh, suggestion to the community they, that they can arrange some programs, religious programs, or counseling that he can sit with the people, those who are ready uh, to go for the marriage with their parents. The girl can come with uh, her parents the boy can come with other, uh, his parents. They, that will be, along with the Maulana or Sheikh, 
they can sit together and uh, in the presence of parents and the scholars the boy and the girl can exchange their views and they can uh, go ahead for uh, their marriage but it is also a difficult task before coming to that place already some homework has been done uh, behind the curtain yes we are we should organize some programs in a peaceful and a religious um, environment we can invite the scholars who can mention the importance of the marriage and the conditions of the marriage the conditions of the spouse selection or the criteria for that yes after hearing that the parents should or uh, create some beautiful environment to sell for the selection of the spouse it's a really uh, important thing to go ahead but also for the jamaat there is a lot of efforts to be put in this kind of the programs to move forward i don't know the mind should sit together the marriage committee alhamdulillah they are organizing some pre marriage uh, seminars those who are uh, ready to go for the marriage another program that in the in the mind of the marriage community uh, committee i think i would like to mention here is uh, at the time of the engagement they should certain programs certain advisers from the scholars to the adults those who are ready go ready for the engagement they can understand the importance of the marriage then they can go ahead lot of work is going on yes still lot of works to be done inshallah we are planning to have certain uh, seminars or conferences or camps to make facilitate our adults to uh, know their responsibilities and go for the uh, selection of their spouse inshallah very soon i think our marriage committee and the wb board can place some uh, suggestions in front of the jamaat inshallah we'll follow those uh, suggestions inshallah highly recommend premarital counseling absolutely in our communities it's done in the catholic faith other christian groups it's high time we do it although a few years ago correct me yeah a few years ago i was in edmonton and the isi isi president there told me that in dar es salaam you have the premarital counseling i was so happy to hear that so when i say this i encourage for all of our communities to do that because that will really help reduce conflict as well as divorce inshallah because there's an understanding is this what i want to do in life with this person because everyone's so caught up in the glitz and glamour of the wedding the dress the party the this and that forget what the point it's not about the wedding it's about the marriage and completing your religion towards god together asantum um on that note please donate generously there's a donation box outside so that we can organize these kind of things i'm sure the youth will be running to the donation box pramukh sir I'll take a question from the ladies now on the mic. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, uh, Sheikh Sayyid, can you please explaining the meaning of this word mawadda because I'm kind of confusing one of the benefit of the marriage that Allah grant mawadda and rahma and when I see somewhere the word mawadda the prophet Muhammad say kullu as'aluk al la as'alu alayya alaykum illa mawaddata fil qurba so what exactly is the meaning of mawadda and if allah is granting mawadda in the marriage why so many marriage are like a roller coaster um we are converting the meaning of the mawadda into faida <laughs> mawadda normally uh, our scholars are there they can explain better than me there is a slight difference between mahabba and mawadda um now mahabba means normally we will translate as a love do uh, aajkal duniya mein bahut bahas hoti hai love ki Uh, love in certain stage uh, because of the physical strength maybe yeah because of the busy schedule maybe the level of the love uh, decreases 
for after a certain time or certain age, uh, the love will uh, become weak. That's why Allah doesn't mention here that I am putting love in between husband and wife. The word has been used as the mawadda. Mawadda means love plus sacrifice. Love plus taking care. Love plus supporting each other. In the mawadda, the word sacrifice is hidden. That means, yes, at a certain stage, the love will decrease as the weekend, but the mawadda will be there, the care will be there, the support will be there, the necessity will be there. If the love with sacrifice come together, then the word mawadda comes forward. Yes, in the between husband and wife, love is there, but sacrifice is not there. Supporting each other is not there. Taking care of each other is not there. Then there is no mawadda. If mawadda is not there, yes, the problems will come in between husband and wife. Waha par insan, jaysay amare teacher ne bataya, ke waha selfish ban jata admi. Waha par ananiyat a jati hai. Waha par ego aata hai. Waha par sari cheeze a jati hai. To Allah ne ka, mawadda means love with sacrifice. Yes, we have to combine Mawadda virt rahma. Thoda age badhti hai na, toh phir mawad mohabbat kam ho jati hai. Then rahmat comes forward. The rahmat means with sacrifice also come with the rahma. And a beautiful environment will come in front of the couple, newly married couple. Ke mawadda ke saath rahmat bhi insaan ko sukoon ata karti hai. Yes, we are not taking the word as it be the meaning of the mawadda. We are considering mawadda as a mahabba. So normally mahabba kamzor hoti hai, to mawadda bhi haath se insaan ke chali jati hai. Iska khas khayal karna bahut zaroori hai. If we are loving Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wa salam, love of Ahlul Bayt with sacrifice, it's not easy to say I love Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wa salam. What an easy sentence to repeat continuously, we love Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wa salam, or we, able to stay on the path of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wa salam? Are we ready to sacrifice our wealth and our life for the sake of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wa salam or not? Just love nahi hai, love ke saath sacrifice to mawaddate Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wa salam humare saamne aati hai, inshaAllah. The next question is going to be from me. Sorry, I need to ask. I'm going to play the devil's advocate. Um, listening to Sister Barak's uh, lecture, I want, I'm wondering how much is this uh, first world issues? Does it relate to us? She's come from Canada. You said a genuine question that um, I'm thinking. Is this really happening here? So I would like Professor Karim to shed some light if he has any with his experience in Tanzania. The question is, are these first world issues or are we are experiencing them here? Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Uh, what you heard from Sister uh, Sister Berak can be uh, translated by many of you in the audience that maybe it is uh, issues of the first world or high income country or the West. But I can assure you, with the 35 years experience in dealing with children, and their families. It is exactly what she has said in many aspects. And I'll give you two examples which says it all, two real examples. An 11-year-old boy developed paralysis of the lower limbs, both the lower limbs. And the parents have been to everywhere, including number of times to India, for all kinds of tests and investigations. And then somebody said, maybe you should go to Dr. Karim. So I kept the child on the bed and ignored the child deliberately while talking to the parents. Then I found his leg is moving, actually, because he could bend his leg without having been noticed. Then I told the parents, you go out. I want to talk to your child. And then I asked him, what is the problem? 
and the whole story opened up, including marital disharmony, physical abuse, and sexual abuse. And when I confronted the parents, of course, not in confrontation like fighting with them or things, they actually, both of them broke down and confessed and agreed that this is a problem. I said, this is the diagnosis of your child's paralysis. You will get no other treatment anywhere except a proper counseling and getting back to normal. This is one example. So it says it all, many things. The other example is a 14-year-old girl brought to my clinic because she's pregnant. And I am not talking about an African Tanzanian. It is an Asian Tanzanian from the community who is brought to the clinic pregnant. And the one who brings her to the clinic is not his father, is not his boyfriend or whoever made her pregnant. It is a very respectable man who says, Marathi bultege, have a anjamche, tame help karo a pregnancy ne kadi nako. Who may kadi saku? Maru kam nati. But I had sleepless nights thinking about what would have gone through this girl. And when I say this, it becomes uh, painful because. How can you finger point our community girl? No, how can you point a finger to a respectable man in the community having done this? You are just creating a story. For heaven's sake, I have been to Hajj many times and I have pledged to Allah that give me the tongue to say the truth, only truth, and nothing else. These are two examples, and therefore it is not an importation of what you are reading from textbook in the West or because they have got statistics and things. These are real things happening right here in our community. So you asked me in the context of our community, very true. When you talk about somatization, means creating a physical illness, these children come with all kinds of problems. Every alternate Sunday, I, knew, I do a neurodevelopment assessment. School ma dhyan nati deto, aggressive che, mare che bija bachaone. I have seen of recent times, a seven-year-old boy climbing on the mother's back and hitting her on the back, hitting the mother until she gets bruises. And my wife who helps me in the clinic is the one who comes in to check upon her because I can't examine the lady. I said, Sirika, can you come and please check this lady? She's complaining of bruises everywhere. Can you please tell me the extent of injuries? And she says, I feel faint. I couldn't see this girl, the injuries on this girl. This is from our community. It's not a story. And lastly, I want to say one thing, that the marriage can go onto rocks if you have wrong expectations. And I'll say this from experience, because I came from a very poor background, and there is no secret about it. And I'm very proud of my mother selling Kitumba and Mandazi to raise me up. But when I got married, I got married to a middle, high average family. And therefore, there was a mismatch. But with the good consciousness, and with very strong religious background of my in-laws, my wife stood by me, like a rock. We ate one meal a day for four years, and nobody knows, and today you, will, you knew it for the first time. We, it was only Maharage or Kunde for seven days a week. And after four years, when I gathered some money, I took her for a meal outside in the hotel for the first time after marriage. She actually was so overwhelmed that she vomited the food. But I'm saying this, that there was perseverance, there was God consciousness, and standing by you, accepting you as you, and not your money. 
And this is what's important to imbibe into your children in marriage, that to stand by your husband, come rain, come sunshine. And the expectations are so poor and so high in sometimes that the marriage is go on rocks. So mawad that comes with good consciousness. Asana sana. Thank you very much. Uh, can you please recite a salawat, please? Allah. I'll take a question. Oh. That Please add so, something. That was so beautiful, the last part. Thank you for sharing that. And when we talk about these humble stories, I think it really encourages our young people, people who are struggling in their marriage, the God consciousness. And how do you stand by your partner when they're treating you so well despite their physical circumstances, their financial circumstances? I just want to address the question that was asked. I don't know what the intention of the question was, but I, I hope it came from a place of hard to believe that this happens as opposed to denying that this is happening. Although, yes, I live in the Western world, I'm a hardcore Iraqi. I go back and forth to Iraq and I sit with women, men, children, uh, youth in Iraq, and I hear these stories there. And Iraq is similar to this part of the world in terms of how they're exposed to things. So it ain't just a Western thing. <laughs> well, she's put me in my place. <clears throat> Next question from the promoter, please. It's not a question, actually. <clears throat> I want to reply you. And these things I couldn't say in Imam Bara or in the mosque. There is a Molana here in Dar es Salaam. And he was taken by a boy to a restaurant. I have a work with you. The boy tells the Molana. The Molana is here, the proof is here in Dar es Salaam. I had a girlfriend in school. She's married. But in a book, she married Nishani Wayani Pase. Molana, is there a loophole that I can give her a child? Here in Dar es Salaam, restaurant Bali, the Molana is in Dar es Salaam. Molana stood up there angry. And went away. I think Sayyid Adil knows this story. So these things are happening here. You are married to someone else. But still, you want to give a nishani to the other lady who is married also. So this is not West, this is Dar es Salaam. Um, wait, I'll take the question because uh, I'll take a question from the lady side on the mic. First and foremost, I'd like to appreciate the organizers and everyone who has um, <clears throat> Can you speak a little louder, please? We can't hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. So, first and foremost, I'd like to appreciate for this seminar, uh, everyone. And uh, since we are doing this, finally, I would like to request rather humbly uh, this is not a question, this is more of a request. Uh, the thing is that when we're looking at uh, how children are sexually abused and the grooming process and all that, I also would like to reiterate one thing, that we are in 2023, even a small five-year-old child is exposed to ads on YouTube that they are watching, and in so many other apps, they know everything already. They don't need to be groomed. They already know, they know what's right and what's wrong. And uh, you know what puts us in fear and why personally I am for child protection is because my child is already, like any other child in the world, exposed. And because of this exposure, I think also you have made this uh, seminar, which we appreciate, but what I would appreciate more is could we have ways on how to make our children focus more towards the things that matter, like their studies, uh, rather than getting distracted by peer pressure, by social media, by the phone? And you know, there's just X amount of screen time that you can limit. Today, our children are having tabs from Al Muntazir School. 
and they can access a lot from the tabs even through the firewall. How do we protect our children? How do we imbibe and help our children to generate their energies and intellect and focus on the right things rather than getting astray? Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Um, inshallah, Dr. Kamal will address this tomorrow, inshallah. Uh, especially with. Thank you. Okay, um, appreciate it. Uh, Irfan Bai has been asking to um, ask, please. Assalamu alaikum. Um, this is regarding uh, the first question that the sister had asked on the other side. Um, my best man during my marriage had told me something. In order for you, for your marriage to be able to work, first and foremost, between you and your wife, inculcate the sifat of Allah in between you two, and nothing, no shaitan, nothing can come in between you two. And this was Brother Hassin Shakur who had told me this, and he was my best man during that time. I just want to point it out. Um, regarding uh, Sheikh, uh, what Sheikh Adil had said, um, it's just an example. An example, when I say example, this was first time heard that I heard from somebody regarding the marriages that uh, women say, why should we spoil our freedom? Why should we spoil our figures? Why should we uh, go through so many issues? Um, then handle tantrums. And then in the end, there's a divorce. And worst part, that sometimes, nowadays, a divorce happens when there's a child, and the child is the one who suffers. Second point here. Um, uh, Brother Irfan, I think that's a good question. Can we stick to that? There's lots going on. Thank you very much. Say that again. Question is, why is there a divorce? Why is divorce? Do you summarize that well? Maybe some more details. No, what I am thinking is, what my request is to you and other uh, our brothers and sisters, don't think about divorce at the time of the marriage. These two are different things. Har shadi ke baad talaq ka sochna zaruri nahi hai bhaiya. Talaq to aur hai, shadi aur hai. The marriage is a recommended thing from according to the Sharia. But divorce is not a recommended thing according to the Sharia. Though it is a considered as a solution, but the solution brings uh, at the end the wrath of Allah Tawarukwa Ta'ala. Yeah, wo halal hai jisme asman jo hai wo laras jata hai. Don't think about the divorce at the time of the marriage. Ab yeh karein ki shadi ke baad problems hai. Lekin mein aapko bata doon, baghair shadi ke jo problems hai, you can't understand. Abhi shayad aapki shadi ho gai hai. Baghair shadi ke jo awaragi hai. Awara pata hai kise kehte hai. Awara jo ghoomta hai na ladka ya ladki, jo problems wahan paida hote hai. Jo stress, jo depression, jo tanhai loneliness, वहाँ पैदा होते हैं वो शादी के बाद आप उसको मिला नहीं सकते कंसीडर नहीं कर सकते शादी यकीनन एक बेहतरीन चीज है एक बेहतरीन इंस्टीट्यूशन है बस उसको संभाल के रखना है संभाल लेता है आदमी तो यकीनन उसकी जिंदगी कामयाब होती है बच्चा भी हो तो बच्चा अगर हुआ है तो फिर बच्चे के लिए झगड़ा क्यों है एट द टाइम ऑफ द ड्यूअर्स वाई पेरेंट्स आर फाइटिंग फॉर द चाइल्ड why they are going to the court that child wants me, child wants me, child wants me. So, child is not a problem. Child is the result of our life. If they are fighting for the child, that means the child is important in their life. It is not a problem. Child is a blessing of Allah. So, after marriage, there are many benefits. There are thousands of benefits. After marriage, there are thousands of benefits. We don't know. The, if you go to the culture where the marriage is not considered as a solution for their desires or for their better life, you'll see the problems more worse than the communities where marriage is there. As dunya phir dobara usi ki taraf aarai jo shadi ki aaj emphasize kiya ja raha hai. Aksar countries me kaar hai shadi karo aur hume bache chahiye. Aaj aise bhi countries hain jahan shadi ko inhone abandon kiya. आज उनके पास 
प्री स्कूलिंग के लिए बच्चे नहीं है आज वो एनकरेज कर रहे हैं कि जाओ शादी करो बच्चे पैदा करो तो उन्हें मालूम है कि ये जो सिस्टम है एक सिस्टम डिवाइन सिस्टम है दो नो अदर सिस्टम कैन कम्पीट विद दिस सिस्टम द सिस्टम ऑफ द मैरिज Folks, we are approaching the end of our program. I'll just take. I have one written question, which uh, Sister Barak is going to answer, and I'm going to take one from the ladies, and one last one from uh, Brother Kazim, uh, Brother Balu. Okay, uh, Sister Barak, could you read out the question? What if I have experienced? What if I have experienced these symptoms and long-term effects mentioned by the talk I gave? but i don't remember being abused as a child as an adult how can i remember my childhood trauma abuse and experience first of all i think it's taken such courage for this person to ask these questions and i think it's beneficial for anybody here who's come across this as a therapist what am i going to say seek a therapy right they'll talk to a therapist who is specialized in this area who can work with somatic systems like the doctor uh, described earlier the physical right and and be able to have the treatment it could be short term could be long term but go seek somebody who specializes perhaps in our system in the the west what we do is you see a family doctor who then refers you to a specialist I'm not sure if that's how it works here same way so you can see a family doctor who can refer you to a specialist in the area yeah and then that person inshallah can be able to help you uncover just be aware that it's very triggering if you especially if you don't remember and i've seen that with clients and patients that i've worked with over the years things they don't remember like i mentioned earlier it comes back later so make sure that you're you know ready prepared to kind of work with this and what it could entail how it could affect your life perhaps there are realizations of people around you that you weren't aware of before like we mentioned 91% of child sexual abuse comes from people that we know so that's another thing to consider is somebody ready to take that step to kind of figure that part out thank you very much sister brock <clears throat> um we'll take a uh, question from farzana bhai assalamu alaikum can you hear me yes we can hear you you can hear me okay I want to ask a question on behalf of the many women that I work with that feel that they haven't had justice whether it's for themselves or whether it's for their children okay in the field of child protection if there's issues that they're seeing that are happening within their household that is having an impact on the child possibly if there's domestic abuse substance abuse and things like that when the woman looks out for that child who is whose future will be um compromised because of what is happening within that household when that woman goes to seek justice i want to ask the question why is that justice of divorce and a safe space for that 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 parent and child to be able to live without the adversity why is that justice not being given within our communities thank you sister prasanna any particular scholar that you would like to answer this question anybody on the panel that you would like to answer this question can i can i add on to that so it's a very important comment there in terms of the justice seeking and the reality here unfortunately we we know that the reality is that people are hiding and covering for each other people in positions of power like i mentioned earlier in the talk they're hiding and covering for the corruption the hypocrisy the atrocities that they know other people in positions of pa in power are committing so what do they do they cover for them what happens to the victims they don't get their justice if they go to the police they go to here they go there nobody's listening to them they're hiding they're covering for the ones who've committed the crimes so what happens then their voices are gone there's no validation no recognition no acknowledgement that what happened to them was truth what happened to them was wrong what happened to them haram this is where we haram police 
the perpetrators, not the victim, not shame the victim, but rather give them a voice, give them a safe space, listen to what they have to say, do a proper investigation and go after the perpetrators. They deserve the full extent of the Islamic as well as the local laws. Do not protect anybody in positions of power who are hurting the victims. I'm speaking on behalf of the victims, of the stories that I have read from this community here and beyond. I speak on behalf of them. I speak up for their voices when I say this. Enough is enough. We call ourselves Muslims, followers of the Ahlul Bayt. Shame on you. Shame on the people who are covering up for each other. Shame. Enough. You call yourself followers of the Mahdi? Do him proud. Because you are the first ones he will cut in half. You are the first ones he's going to purify his sword with. You have to understand this. I'm speaking on behalf of the fire and the pain that I have seen from the victims. Enough is enough. Asantum. Can I please ask both other panel members to also answer that? Um, question? Will, uh, yes. um, for the justice, are we ready to accept the judgment of the, the verdict of the judge? Our mind is ready to accept whether in the favor or the against of the victims. Sometimes we are not seeking justice. Sometimes we are searching a solution to run away from the families or the societies. Justice ko agar hum dhoondenge, accept karenge tayar hai, or we are having a small group of people, those who are solving the problems of the community, are they ready to accept it? Majority of the times we are not seeking justice, majority of the times we are planning to show the opponent our power. यहाँ पर जस्टिस से ज्यादा जो वर्ड मैं यूज कर सकता हूँ सॉरी टू से दर कई मरतबा हमने फैसला किया ये फैसला है दिस इज द जजमेंट अकॉर्डिंग टू द शरिया दे गो आउट एंड द टॉक अबाउट अगेंस्ट द जज इट सेल्फ हिम सेल्फ ये जजमेंट ये हमारे फेवर में नहीं है वी आर नॉट गोइंग टू एक्सेप्ट दिस वन मैं लफ्ज इस्तेमाल कर सकता हूँ यहाँ पर सॉरी टू से दैट वर्ड वी आर नॉट सीकिंग द जस्टिस बट वी आर ready to take revenge from the people, those who are standing in front of us. Because after, to get the revenge from them, we are going the beyond the justice too. Kitne cases hamare paas police mein hai, kitne cases hamare paas court mein hai, we already mentioned them. This case is, the solution of this case is this, this and this and this. They are not accepted. They went to the court after two years, after three years, four years, they come back to the same people, those who are, they visited at the beginning and they're begging for the justice. That means that we are ready to use our power, our uh, ego, to show the other person what power we are having, how much power we are having. We are not ready to seek the justice. Even in the court, after the verdict of the court, we are not ready to accept it. Here, the word the God conscious will come in forward. मैं अपने हमारे दोस्तों को यही कहता हूँ हमेशा वी आर ओपनिंग कुरान बिफोर मैरिज फॉर इस्तेखारा यस आर वी ओपनिंग द सेम कुरान आफ्टर मैरिज टू सॉल्व अवर प्रॉब्लम्स और नॉट आर वी रेडी टू सेलेक्ट वन हकम फ्रॉम अवर फैमिली मेंबर और हकम फ्रॉम अनदर फैमिली मेंबर टू सॉल्व अवर प्रॉब्लम्स और नॉट आफ्टर मैरिज वी आर नॉट रेडी टू ओपन द कुरान there is no place for the istikhara in the marriage, but still we are opening the Quran for the istikhara to start the marriage life, but we are not opening the Quran to get the solution from the Quran for our problems. Really, if we seek the justice, the justice will be there in this world. People are there who are ready to uh, follow the Sharia and give the verdict according to the Sharia. Inshallah, together, हो सकता है कहीं कमी जजेस में रही हो हो सकता है कहीं कहीं कमी जजमेंट्स में रही हो बिकॉज ऑफ देयर नॉलेज द लेस नॉलेज 
लेकिन दोनों तरफ से अगर इफ वी आर क्लियर हैविंग द क्लियर इंटेंशन इफ यू आर रेडी टू एक्सेप्ट द जजमेंट ऑफ द जज अकॉर्डिंग टू द शरिया अल्लाह विल ओपन द डोर्स ऑफ जस्टिस इन आवर लाइफ इन शाह दिंग्स विल बिकम बेटर इन शाह Uh, that is a very good question about why justice is not given to the victim there are three reasons for it number one is the denial by the so called protectors of the community number two is hypocrisy and number three is the wear out of the person helping you to get justice become so frustrated with the system that they give in they give up i give you this with examples uh way back in 1991 um uh, i am actually surprised i am given this forum today but it was like almost from then on he is not supposed to take a podium in this community he's an anti community person 1991 when i spoke about hiv aids in the community before speaking about that in a very big seminar of medical uh, doctors and things uh, dr mohammad walji mohammad taki walji central health board of world federation there was a big seminar here and some of you might remember it like probably dr kazim uh some senior doctors who are here they will remember this so i did a survey because i have this a little ocd of doing research on everything i speak so i did a survey on promiscuity or sexual encounter before marriage or in schools and i presented the statistics that in ist between the age of 13 and 18 boys this much sexual exposure according to self reported from those boys so nobody said anything and zizima this much and other school this much and i said lastly and al muntazir this much and just how can you ever make such derogatory statement of such a pak or pakiza school of al muntazir so it was a big issue a big seminar finished with a meeting a close meeting of saying that i should apologize about having said negative things about al muntazi school boys who are supposed to be the pure of the purest so i said yes i will apologize but give me the mic again then i will apologize and you know what i'll say so this is number one we don't want to accept it so you won't get the justice the second one a young boy he was in grade 6 the mother brings the child to my clinic because she observes some signs and symptoms of being abused with discharge and bleeding and whatever happened So I I asked the mother what happened and she he said she said that this boy is claiming this happened in the school so he went to the school and said this this kind of tohmat comes in in our school there's nothing like this happening in our school nothing happens like this and it was shunned and everything happened and the last one was we were fighting for this girl who was abused by a madrasa teacher and we went to uh, the police we went to the social welfare we went to various different places i won't say what was the outcome of the girl because the outcome was good because some very good people in this world exist who took care of her until she became a professional person but it was an uphill task to get her justice and after the teacher was put into custody for two weeks two weeks later he is out in the street laughing and uh, joking and when we met her met him on the street he said 
What happened to all your court cases? Nothing. I'm here. Now I'm waiting. Let me meet her again and you'll see what I do. They are threatening us. And then you give up. Because it's impossible in this situation to do it alone. There is no social structure to help. Therefore, the injustice goes on. You don't get the justice for these three reasons. One is denial, second is hypocrisy, and third one, you are alone fighting the battle. Then you give up. It's hard. Thank you very much, Doctor. Can you please recite another salawat, please? Wow. I'll take the last question from Mr. Balu. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. I thank everybody for coming here, but I actually thank you personally, uh, my sister. In the first time that I actually see this podium has actually heard the le three letter word abusive, child abuse, sexual abuse, which came out from you. This, I have two questions I'm going to divide into two. But before putting that question forward, I thought actually I wanted to answer that, the question you raised regarding the protection of my child of being groomed. You raised the question to ponder and then come back. So, I have the answers. I will give you really little points. My answers would be keep personal information private, private settings, which is important, receiving, looking at the apps that the kids use, know what the friends are, safe online for what they use, encourage children to talk, which is the most important. Now, coming to the question, and I want everybody to understand, my question is, the person who is attracted to children, which is pedophile. So I'll make it simple. My question will be divided into two. We've, uh, un, I would say an example, Mr. Uh, a kid, Mr. X, I would say a kid X is abused because there are people who are attracted to children and that's the biggest core problem in community, in the country, in everywhere. So that kid now comes to the parents. Can he tell the parents if he does? What happens? If he goes to the outside, that's the community part, how does he go? The biggest fear comes down to is don't ask, don't tell. And I think you understand where, what I mean very correctly. We have a problem. The community has never come open to have a discussion in this level. Looking at you, became emotional in the last sentences that you were using because I like reading, I like reading body language. Sorry, Mr. Well, also, doctor. Could you shorten the question? Sorry, yeah. So I, I, the reason I'm coming down to is because this question is very important and I think she's understood because that was the main point of her speaking. What do you, what do you advise us? When you find a pedophile who has already abused a child, what can the child do? And how do we bring that pedophile into public information? Because we need to protect. So if you can give us two levels of answers, this will teach us as parents how to protect our kids. Is that clear? So question number one is how do you get the child to speak out to you, to parents. And then the other one, part of the question is justice. Because if they do, they have a fear. The future, if there's a boy, they will not be able to get married. The girl, she will not get a boy. So there's a fear here. Don't ask for help. So how do you advise, what do you advise to do? So those are excellent questions, and I think it does come down to the crux of the trust and the relationship you have with your child that you developed from before they were born. 
right? And even then, sometimes the child may not want to share something so devastating with the family because they don't want them to be hurt or because it's somebody they know, right? So you cannot necessarily force it out of your child, but watch for behaviors. If it's a young child, if it's a young adult, perhaps therapy can bring it out, right? In terms of the justice, I think it really depends where you are, what the rules are, the regulations, which other part of the world that you live in. Essentially, to follow our rules from our faith, which I, I cannot tell you what they are. But as parents, we know what we want to do to the perpetrator when we hear these things. La Samaha Allah happens to our child, we want to go after them with blood. We can't do that, right? We have to follow regulations, whether it's the law or Sharia law. But definitely justice needs to happen. And like I mentioned earlier, there has to be that openness, that willingness, that you know what? Something did happen here. And there has to be consequences and punishments for people who do this. For pedophiles, and this happens all over the world. We're not saying, by the way, this is a Muslim problem, a Muslim problem. It's not. It's a worldwide problem. Every community. It's that marad nafsi that illness, the evil diseases of the heart that our faith teaches us, it's in psychology, right? And so they need to get the proper help for that. Definitely rules and regulations around, let's say if you have people, and I'm specifically talking about our communities. If you know people have a tendency to want to inappropriately touch children, or the opposite or same gender, or whatever the case may be, do not give them the positions where they are able to be with the vulnerable populations. Does that make sense? Don't put them in those roles. People in positions of power, use your power the right way. Don't cover or say, oh, I'm gonna give them the opportunity, or you know they have a sickness, why are you giving them that position? You hear people taking kids to Ziyadah groups, if you know that the Ziyadah group has somebody who is hurting the children? Why are you sending the kids alone with them? Say, Muhammad Rizvi in Toronto before Ziara specifically gave guidelines on what to do with your kids when it comes to these situations. Go back to that lecture and listen to it. He said, don't send your kids alone in Ziara groups. Wait till they're older, go together if you want to protect them. This is one example, following what Say Muhammad Rizvi said. It's not easy, though, to deal with these situations. We're still learning as a community. Like you said, it's the first time we're talking about this, and that's the first thing I said when we started. I commend this community, specifically here in Dar es Salaam, for taking this on and setting the precedence and example for the rest of the Shia world to tackle these deeper mental health issues that are pushing our kids away from our faith. They don't come to these places anymore. They don't feel safe. They're not being validated. They carry this. I know those who are listening and watching right now. I know a lot of you who you are. You don't know that I know, but I know. And I know the pain that you're carrying and that you're struggling. And it's okay to come out and get the help. There are people who are going to believe you and who are going to be here for you, regardless of the people in positions of power. It's time we tackle these topics head on, not shy away. And the people in position of power, I repeat for the third time, your day will come. If not in this dunya, in the akhirah. Don't think that what you have done now is going to be gone because there are people who in money and power can protect you. That goes against our basic beliefs in our faith. Right? Thank you very, very much. Guys? Yes. <clears throat> Promise as delivered and more. Alhamdulillah. I think there's a lot of food for thought. Uh, different perspectives, uncomfortable definitely, and uh, like everybody said on the top table that this is what we're here for, we have to go with it, um, so inshallah, we we'll close today's uh, session with this, and uh, I would like to urge you to attend the rest of the sessions, sorry, uh, evaluation form is going to come to you through the broadcast, please fill them out, while it's fresh in your mind, so that we know how to better, how to improve these kind of conferences. Okay? Thank you very much. Can you please recite a huge salawat? Allahumma swalli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. 8 o'clock, right? 9 o'clock. Uh, tomorrow, 9 o'clock, guys. 
9 a.m. for the first session. And then, thank you.